excuse me, little dog. Alright, guys. Well, that keeps trying to be a fine December 80 degree day here. Closing up the fall of 2021. I guess tomorrow is the last day of fall of 2021. That would make today uh, Sunday, December 19th, 2021. And uh, the little dog and I just hanging out here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, scrounging for food here in the uh, Point Lonesome Swamp. Since it is Sunday, you know, it's always a fun challenge looking uh, for my doomsday sermon. And I was going to do a sermon about wetlands. I was going to go on to Manga Bay and read that story about, uh, you know, basically how we're destroying every last wetland on this planet. But as some of you may know, I think I've already worn out the subject of wetlands. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to go from wetlands to wildfires. Because, uh, you know, in the, in the sermon, I, I really like to steer somewhat away from the actual news headlines and facts and figures and just uh, hear from various folks around the planet figuring out where this planet is heading, and I guess this case is where it already is. And we're going to go over there and check in with Counterpunch, the fine folks over at Counterpunch, uh, for this week's selection uh, from a woman I've never heard of, <clears throat> Jane Braxton Little. And Jane Braxton Little is going to give us a tour guide to hell on earth, small town style. Anybody thinking you have to go into the uh, bowels of a mega city <clears throat> to find hell on earth, there's plenty of hells on earth right here in small town America. <clears throat> Take it away, Jane. Half a mile south of what is left of the old Gold Rush era, era town of Greenville, California, Highway 89 climbs steeply in a series of S-turns as familiar to me as my own backyard. From the top of that grade, I have sometimes seen bald eagles soaring over the valley that stretches to the base of Ketty Peak, the northernmost mountain in California's Sierra Nevada range. I have had the pleasure many times of being right in the spot she's talking about. <clears throat> Today, stuck at the bottom, thanks to endless road work, I try to remember what these hillsides look like before the Dixie Fire torched them in a furious 104-day climate change charged rampage across nearly 1 million acres, an area larger than the state of Delaware. They were so green then, pines, cedars, and graceful Douglas firs mixed with oaks pushing through the thick conifer foliage in a quest for light and life. Today, I see only slopes studded with charred stumps and burnt trees jackstrawed across the land like so many giant pickup sticks. <clears throat> Dixie did far more than take our entire forest. It raised Greenville, my hometown since 1975, it reduced house after house to rubble, leaving only chimneys where children once had hung Christmas stockings in dead, century-old oaks where families spanning four generations had not so long ago built tree forts. The fire left our downtown with scorched, bent-over lampposts touching debris-strewn sidewalks, 
the historic sheriff's office is just a series of naked half round windows eerily showcasing devastation like natural disasters everywhere this fire has upended entire communities <clears throat> sadly i have plenty of time to contemplate these devastating changes i am the first in a long line of vehicles halted by a burly man clad in night and neon yellow and wielding a stop sign on a six-foot pole we motorists are all headed toward quincy the seat of plumas county and its largest town my mission is to retrieve the household mail, a task that would ordinarily have required a five-minute walk from my second-floor office to the Greenville Post Office. Now, it's a 50-mile round-trip drive that sometimes takes four hours due to the constant removal of hazardous trees. I'm idling here impatiently. Greenville still has a zip code, but the fire gutted the concrete block building that was our post office. The box where I once received magazines, bills, and hand-decorated cards from my grandkids lies on its back, collecting ashes. Whoever promised that neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night would impede postal deliveries never anticipated the ferocity of the Dixie Fire. Few did. That blaze erupted in forest primed for a runaway inferno by a climate that is changing before our eyes. Temperatures worldwide are up 2.04 degrees Fahrenheit since 1901 and 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit in the U.S. since 1970. This year is California's driest in a century. She must have written this right before that big storm uh, blew in a few weeks ago. Only 11.87 inches of rain or snow fell, less than half what experts deem average. Combine that with a century of forest management that suppressed natural fires and promoted the logging of large, more fire-resistant trees, and these forests needed only a spark to erupt into a barrage of flames that swept from the Feather River Canyon to north of Lassen Volcanic National Park the equivalent of traveling from Philadelphia to New York City. <clears throat> Pacific Gas and Electric Company, normally called PG&E, almost certainly provided that spark as company officials told the California Public Utilities Commission. Earlier, they had accepted responsibility for the deadly 2018 campfire, which destroyed the sadly named town of Paradise, and three other blazes. Those fires are the outsized products of corporate greed and a gross failure to maintain the company's electrical infrastructure. PG&E's negligence comes at a time when a dramatically changing climate is wreaking havoc worldwide. For every victim of the Dixie Fire, there are thousands who were hit last November by massive hurricanes in North and Central America and hundreds of thousands who find themselves escaping rising seas in places like Bangladesh and elsewhere in the Global South. As the United Nations High Commissioner for refugees reported in April, the number of people displaced by climate change related disasters since 2010 has risen to 21 and a half million, most of them in poor countries and small island states. 
climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe calls all of this global weirding, adding, quote, no matter where we live or what we care about, we are all vulnerable to the devastating impacts of a warming planet, close quote. Ten minutes pass. The bored man with the stop sign pounds it onto the pavement like a squirrel defending its nuts. What about a squirrely defending its nuts like that? Yes, squirrel defending its nuts. Waiting here in a quest to retrieve my mail is the least of the indignities of living in the scar of the Dixie Burn. In fact, I am among the fortunate Although the fire did destroy my office in downtown Greenville, the erratic winds that bamboozled firefighters for months inexplicably shifted flames away from my house and the surrounding forest land. Two neighboring communities had already gone up in a firestorm of, of torched trees and burning embers after a pyrocumulus cloud collapsed above them on July 24th. Ten days later, it took less than 45 minutes for fire to reduce Greenville's tarnished gold rush charm to smoldering ash. The town has now lain comatose for more than four months. Those of us whose houses were spared drive through its drive through it white knuckled, stomach churning, compulsively reciting the names of our neighbors whose ruined homes we pass. Like the victims of climate disasters everywhere, such former residents have scattered to the I'm sorry to use the word winds in a diaspora that has shattered our community and left those of us who remain wondering how we can possibly rebuild our town. Greenville has always been the stepsister of Plumas of Plumas County, the least affluent of its four major communities, the least politically significant, and the first to be threatened with school closures. It lacks even one rich philanthropic resident. In fact, its median income declined 15% in 2019 to $26,875 Try supporting a family on that, even without a major wildfire. It is no surprise then that this neediest of Plumas County communities is suffering the most. <clears throat> As Solomon Siang reported in 2017 in Science Magazine, climate change inflicts its heaviest economic impacts on the poorest 5% of the population, reducing average incomes post-disaster by as much as 27%. When California Governor Gavin Newsom visited Greenville shortly after it was devastated, he mentioned getting calls from friends at Lake Altamont, a wealthy, well-connected enclave 15 miles to the north, but not from our town, of course. The state authorized an immediate $5 million for disaster relief there, but the response of county officials, county officials has been anemic at best. County supervisors have done a little more proactive than declare a disaster. The county school district district responsible for the virtually undamaged Greenville Elementary and High School campus, talk about survival miracles, took no initiative to turn its abundant facilities into safe, warm, functioning spaces for Dixie victims. 
only recently has it agreed to house a resource center providing them with everything from blankets and jackets to soup and cat food. At the most local level, the Indian Valley Community Service District with bankruptcy looming is struggling with how to collect the usual fees for water and sewer use with, from a town with almost no residents. The local Chamber of Commerce is in complete disarray. Yes, the anguish of living in a burn scar takes a toll. My dreams are littered with drifting pages of burned books and bearing faces I no longer see here. A blue-eyed woman with a voice like a code red alert. A clerk with straight black, black hair cascading down his back. We lock eyes before they sink into the dark. Twenty minutes pass. And then uh, this goes on and on. 32 minutes pass. 57 minutes pass. One hour and 45 minutes. So we're going to skip ahead to one hour and 45 minutes. After one more tree removal stop, I finally arrive in Quincy to find a post box crammed with slick flyers from attorneys promising to recover my monetary losses. Call it cruelty or irony, but among the envelopes is a bill from PG&E. I fill up with gas, still not available in Greenville, and face what could be another two-hour drive back through that same scarred landscape. <clears throat> it's dark by the time I arrive in Greenville. The lights still on in Evergreen Market are welcoming, but most of the town has no electricity or even poles to mount streetlights. The only true intersection at Highway 89 and what's left of Main Street is illuminated by a generator when it's working. It's a little chancy, but I take a shortcut on a side street past burned out resi residential debris looming in the dark, and there suddenly are tiny lights spiraling improbably into the night on a 10-foot Christmas tree. Just beyond it, multicolored lights outline a set of stairs to a house that is no longer there. Who knows where those lights will lead us? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so that article uh, originally appeared in Tom Dispatch. And if uh, you want to read the uh, what happened between 20 minutes and uh, in an hour and 45 minutes. It's all there, guys. Uh, anyway, I think that's a fine uh, holiday cheer story. The uh, Christmas lights leading up the stairs to a house that is no longer there. And... Uh, what is it now? Is it six days till Christmas? Good Lord, but uh, I have run into the tragedy of my uh, my coffee creamer has curdled. And uh, so for the first time since Wednesday, it has been four days since I have uh, cranked up my gas sucking truck and gone in uh, to town. But I have some curdled coffee creamer and the little dog is out of food. So we are off to have some social intercourse in the oasis of freedom. 
while we still can. Bye, guys.